Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. This is day three. I got it right. I yes. practiced all day. And uh, day three, and we're thrilled uh, for what God is doing. He's doing a good work here in our hearts. I really appreciated the messages, especially last night. Very thought-provoking. And uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. That's our theme verse for uh, our meetings this week with um, evangelist uh, Tim Thompson. We're so glad for his family, for Brittany and the boys. It's been a joy to have them. So in uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 11, are you there? Okay, good. Uh, the Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, if you were here last night, you're never going to look at chapter 4 the same way you did before. And so that's exciting, too, as it was expounded and, and uh, for us to understand. So worthy is he is our, um, is our uh, theme for this week. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you now for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you not only did he bear our sins, not only was he buried, but he rose again the third day. And because he has life, we have life. So thank you that not only can we be saved, but we can then uh, grow in our Christ-likeness and make a difference uh, here on earth until you either return or we go home by death. But Father, thank you for the confidence we have of eternal life because of the work of Christ on the cross. Now bless and encourage us tonight as we once again look into the scriptures and uh, for what you have for us. Now bless and encourage us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, our Savior is worthy of worship. Let's stand this evening, and we're going to sing song 153 to open the service. 153. Father, creator, you 
great singing. Praise the Lord. We're going to continue singing My Jesus Fair and focus on the words about our Savior and what he's done for us. He certainly is worthy because of who he is and also because of what he's done for us. Um, we understand from the message last night, it was who he is, but to remember the cross as we sing this song. My Jesus fair was pierced by thorns, by thorns grown from the fall. Thus he who gave the curse was torn to end that curse for all. My Jesus meek was scorned by man, by man. I've been redeemed by the blood of Calvary's Lamb Washed in the blood when I come just as I am For in Jesus I believe, heaven's gift I now receive He has given life, I've been redeemed He has welcomed every lost soul in he has given victory and the freedom from our sin. We are all made new, for we know God's word is true. Jesus Christ has given us new life. I've been redeemed by the blood of Calvary's lamb. Washed in the blood when I come just as I am. For in Jesus I believe, heaven's gift I now receive. He has given life, I've been redeemed. And won't you come accept this gift today? Jesus is the Lamb of God, the life, the truth, the way. Heaven can be home, you will never be alone. Jesus offers you eternal life. 
Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Washed in the blood when I come just as I am. For in Jesus I believe, heaven's gift I now receive. He has given life, I've been redeemed. Praise Him, He has given life, I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. And Jesus is the sweetest and the greatest, and it's a pleasure to be able to serve him and to be known by him and to know him. It's good to see you here tonight. Thanks for coming out on this Tuesday night, third night of the uh, meeting. I'm looking forward to the time that we have together now as we look into God's word. Let me go ahead and dismiss kiddos while you are finding your place in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter number five. And Miss Brittany and Mr. Seth are going to take the kiddos back. We'll give them just a moment to go. Okay. Hey, I hope you had a good day today. And uh, it's a, it was an enjoyable day, beautiful day outside. I mean, the weather was, was uh, very nice. As a friend of mine says, it was Larapin, which means just beautiful and tasty and great. And so uh, it was just a nice day um, with the weather, and it's cooling down a little bit now. And so it lets us remember that it is fall, after all. And, that, and uh, that's, that's what's going to take place in Chicago, right? So... Uh, <laughs> the wind will start coming in no time flat. So, hey, for those of you who were not able to be here last night, um, the, the truth that was mentioned last night and um, the message is one that 
Um, not, not, because I'm, not because I'm the one that spoke it, but because of the truth that it is. It's one of those messages that if you were not able to be here last night, I would encourage you to take some time to consider Revelation chapter 4. And are the services recorded? Are they online anywhere? Okay. All right, so th they're being sent out. There would be one that I would highly encourage you to listen to. Again, not because me, I'm, I'm the messenger. I'm, I'm the in-between person. Um, but the truth of it is something that is highly valuable. So if you weren't able to be here for last night, please do listen to that truth and get it. It will help all the others to make sense if that is at the foundational level of uh, where we are. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, we have um, given to us here a summarizing verse. I love verses that summarize truths. Um, I'm, I am very much a uh, bullet point person, just by nature. Um, probably uh, most of the males in here are. Uh, where we like, now, well, you know, that's not, that's not perfectly fair, because if any of you are detailed, some people, if you're, if you're going to do something, you're going to read everything there is to know about it, and study it out, and figure it out, and then you're going to step forward on it after you've studied it out and seen everything that's going to happen. There are the rest of us who will pay $9.95 for an app on our phone that just tells us what to do, so we don't have to think about anything, and we don't have to research at all. I, I like things to just be capsulated. Like, okay, give, give, me the, um, give me the main points, give me the bullet points, and we can fill, out, we can fill in everything else as the time goes on. Well, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, it's what, it's what you have. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has been addressing this church and explaining truth and truths that are very, very important. And then he just takes a moment in Ephesians 5, 8 and says, all right, let me boil it down for you. Let me give you the, um, this is what really matters. So if you have Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look together at verse number 8. And we will see what it says, what it means, why it matters, and our time will be finished. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, ah, verse number 8, the Bible says this, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now... Are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. Hey, would you mind uh, reading this verse with me? I'll give the reference and then let's read it together. Here we go. Ready? Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Once more, we'll have it. Here we go. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask the Lord to help me because I want this to be beneficial for all of us and that God would teach us everything he wants us to know and that this passage would impact our lives the way I think he intends for it to. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus and already my heart is full and blessed just because of remembering who you are and how worthy you are of worship. Ah, by your very essence, and then because of your kindnesses to us, specifically in Christ, um, our hearts have already been taken, as it were, up into the glories to consider and remember your plan, and at least in part, what we understand, what it cost. And now we have the opportunity to look into your um, word, which you have preserved, so that we might learn and know you and to know what it is you want for us we come tonight father because we want to be used by you we want to want things that are eternal so where our hearts need to be adjusted or our focus needs to be channeled would you please by your spirit and through your word would you please do that tonight in our hearts in my heart and in the hearts of these who have gathered together this evening. And then, Father, if there are some here tonight who don't yet know you, or maybe some who are watching who don't yet know you, I pray that you'd please convince them in the greatest way they have ever been convinced of their sin and of the righteousness that they need, of the judgment to come, and of the one who can provide the righteousness that they need. May they be fully convinced, and may they come to faith as a result of the hearing of your word. All of this, Father, I ask in faith, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for your glory 
Amen. Okay, tonight I'd like to start by uh, basically giving us two good Bible words. And uh, they're not words that are found in this passage, but the truths of these words are. And I'm going to go ahead and confess to you at the beginning of this message right now that what I'm about to go through over the next several minutes is a little bit more on the teachy side. But it's not teachy without intent. That is, it, it, it's on purpose and it is necessary, needful, and helpful. So if you're inclined not to enjoy teaching so much, kick that feeling to the curb and stay connected through the next several minutes. All right, so two words that sound similar mean something a little bit different. They're good words, Bible words, but not words that we use every day. And so they take a little bit of uh, explaining. First word is the word justification. Justification. Now I'm going to invite a little bit of conversation tonight, so be prepared to be involved in this. Because again, as I mentioned earlier this week on Sunday, I want to make certain that this is connecting, that it's making sense. And if it's not, then we need to know that so that it can make sense. We don't want this to be wasted for anyone. So justification. What, what does the word justification mean? Give me, a, give me a definition. Justification is what? Okay. Declared righteous. All right. I, has, any of you, uh, has anybody else ever heard this? Just as if I'd never sinned, which is actually more of an application or a playing out of justification, but it's connected to the declared righteous. So um, any, anybody else, anything else? Yeah, it, it, it does. It is connected to your standing. Now, I will say this because I'm speaking to people who have uh, either some of you have grown up in church. Some of you have um, been coming to church for long enough that you've heard some teaching about this. I asked a group one time about what the word justification meant and nobody was willing to answer, at least no adults. But there was an 11 year old boy that was there and he was very willing to give an answer. And his answer was this. He said, it's the reason why I'm right. Now, we laugh, but in reality, I mean, think about it from an 11-year-old's standpoint. You're upstairs with your kid sister, and your kid sister starts crying, and mom comes storming up the stairs and looks in, and the kid sister's laying over on the floor and crying and holding her arm, and you, as an 11-year-old boy, are standing there, and your mom says, what did you do? Well, I hit her, but let me explain why. Let me tell you why it was... It, why it was okay for me to do this. In other words, he was explaining why he was right, or he was declaring himself to be righteous. He was saying why, it was, why he was right. Okay, so biblically, when we talk about justification, or rather when God does, justification means to be declared righteous. Now, justification takes place the moment a person puts their faith in Christ for salvation. At the moment a person trusts Christ as Savior, at that moment, God declares that person to be righteous. It is not something that is earned, and it is not something that is merited. It is something that is done by God. It's done in a moment, and it's an act completely of God in the sense that it is he who declares this person to be righteous. Now, when Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed to pay for our sins. So that when I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Rescuer, it is his blood that is applied to my life that washes away my sin. And in that same moment, God also, ah, the Bible word is imputes, he gives to me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is done and done. I am a child of God because I am now righteous in his eyes. Now it is not my righteousness. That is, it's not a matter of my doing right, doing right, doing right, adding up enough righteousnesses on my own behalf that eventually God says, ah, You've come along far enough. I will go ahead and declare you the rest of the way to be righteous. It's not that at all. My righteousnesses, we learned this last night, are as filthy rags, but it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is granted or given to me 
the moment I received him as my Savior. And in God's sight, I am declared, because of Christ, to be righteous. Sins forgiven, the righteousness of Christ put to my account. When God sees me, he sees me through the righteousness of Christ. Thank God for justification. Thank God that I have been declared righteous. That's the first word. Second word. Sounds similar, means something different. Anybody want to take a guess at what it may be? All right, so you have justification and sanctification. Now, the word sanctification or sanctify, sanctification means to be set apart. Biblically, sanctification is a process where over time I begin to live out what I am as a justified person. That is, I, I become more and more like what I have already been declared to be. Okay, let me ask you, class, what have I been declared to be as a justified person? I am declared to be... Now, specifically, whose righteousness is it that has been given to me so that I can be declared righteous? Okay, so that sanctification is this process where in my life and over time, I begin to become more and more like the one who has already given me his righteousness. That is, I become more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, it's a process. There's a sense, biblically, on occasion you'll see this, there's a sense in which sanctification happens uh, in a moment in the sense that I have been set apart onto something new. But the practical ramifications, the practical living out of sanctification is that over time I become more and more like what I am as a justified person, which is righteous, and that righteousness specifically belongs to Jesus Christ. That is, I'm becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, stop just for a second. This is important. You may already know this. If you do, then thank God for it. If you don't, this is important. Sometimes, because of making certain that we want to keep, um, we want everyone to understand the truth about what the Bible says and what God expects and the differences between justification and sanctification. Sometimes, we preachers will cause there to be a division between justification and sanctification. And the reason why is because justification and sanctification are different. Because it's not, as I mentioned, it's not as if a person becomes more and more and more like Jesus Christ and eventually God says, ah, that's good enough. Now I will go ahead and justify you and give you the rest of the righteousness you need. You don't work yourself into justification. That's an act of God. It's done through faith in Jesus Christ. When it happens, it's done and done. And sanctification is different. Okay, but listen to me and please catch this. But you cannot separate justification and sanctification. Biblically, you cannot say, well, all that really matters is justification. And if sanctification happens, then great. But if it doesn't, ah, at least justification can happen. When you do that, you separate something that God never separates. His intention in justification is to begin this process of bringing you back to what he originally created you to be in the first place. In fact, the Bible says this, that it has been predestined that those who have been justified will be sanctified. So that it is the will of God that every person who experiences justification 
then we'll begin this process of sanctification. Now, problem is, sometimes we look at people's lives and we don't see the process happening at the same speed we think it ought to be going at, and so we start saying, well, by their lack of sanctification, we believe them not to be justified. Whoa, that's not something that we can do. Justification is an act of God. It's done when a person trusts Christ as a Savior. And sanctification is a process which means it happens over time. However, don't fall into the trap of saying all that matters is justification. Sanctification is a mm, maybe, maybe not, doesn't really matter. That is, that is not, that is not biblical. That is not what God says. Now, they're not the same thing, but they are most certainly connected. Now, sometimes ah, when we look at justification and sanctification, the temptation can be for those of us who have been justified and are in the process of being sanctified is that when we hear about justification and being declared righteous, we say, thank God and hallelujah, God does a work in me and he declares me to be righteous. I am so grateful for this. And then we hear about sanctification, where over time we are supposed to become more and more like Jesus Christ, and we go, oh, what a heavy weight. Oh, man, justification is this freedom from sin and righteousness granted. Sanctification is this, oh, man, I'm just going to keep on showing how utterly poor and wretched and failure I am, and oh, to be, man, to become like the Lord Jesus, that is a weight on my shoulders. Okay, time out. Stop. Think for a moment. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to be like Jesus? I mean, if you could be, would you? It'd be easier to ask it this way. How many of you wives wish your husband were just like Jesus Christ? May I see your hands, please? Okay, how many husbands would like to have a wife that was just like Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if your pastor was just like Jesus Christ? Can I have a witness? And pastor, wouldn't it be great if the people in the church were just like Jesus Christ? So here's the deal. It's never intended to be a weight on your shoulders. It is intended to be a matter of Hey, look at the plan God has. Look at what his intention is for you, not only to rescue you from your sin and to give you the righteousness of Christ, but beyond that, it is his desire, his design, his will that you are going to become over time in your living out of life more and more like Jesus Christ. That's not bad. That's Good. Now, the reason why I've taken time this evening to talk about justification and sanctification is because while the words are not in this verse, the concepts are. Look, look down at Ephesians 5, 8 again, and I want you to see this. In fact, I'm going to read part of the verse, and I'm going to stop. And I want you to tell me if the part that I read is speaking about justification or sanctification, okay? So Ephesians 5, 8 says this. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Okay, is that justification or sanctification? Okay, it's justification. You were darkness, that is, you used to be in, in, the, in the dark. You are part of that which is different from God. You were um, without understanding. You were without connection to God. He's light and in him is no darkness at all. But you are in darkness. But now, after the rescue, after the salvation, now are you light in the Lord. You passed from death unto life. Now you're light in the Lord. So that is justification. So then the rest of the verse says, walk as children of light. Is that justification or sanctification? Yeah, because there's only one left, people. you got to get this one right. Walk as children of light. In other words, the word walk is live. Choices. Your, your life is made up of, of choices. You, you know that, right? I'm speaking to people who are old enough to know this. Life is not made up of wants, wishes, dreams, desires. Life is made up of choices, and the choices you make determine where you end up in life. So that when he talks about walk as a child of light, he's saying, in essence, live like 
what you are. You are a child of light. Justification, you've been declared by God to be righteous. The righteousness of Christ has been granted to you. Now, live like what you are. Live out your justification. Well, you're a righteous person. Whose righteousness is it? It's Jesus Christ. So he's saying, live like Jesus Christ. Now again, this is not, please, please catch this. And I'll, I'll show this to you in a minute, biblically, so that you can live, I trust, in faith and confidence in this. This is never intended to be a weight on your shoulders like good luck. This is now the chain you chose. You, released, you were released from the chains of sin, but now you have the chain around you to live like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not it at all. It is very much grace upon grace and freedom upon freedom. It is, oh, huh, victory in Jesus. That, that's what this is about. To know that God's plan, his design, is that I get to become more and more like Jesus Christ, even if I don't myself rejoice at that, my children ought to, and my wife should, and my neighbors and the people I work with should be overjoyed that I'm going to become more and more like Christ. What a blessed neighbor that would be, huh? Okay, so, so that's in essence what he's saying. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that Ephesians 5.8 is a summarizing verse where the Apostle Paul summarizes what he has been teaching up to this point to the church in Ephesus, and he write, he's written this letter. In fact, you, you can see justification mentioned. Uh, well, quote for me, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You remember how it starts? For by grace... Okay, through faith, and not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you have justification, you have this, you've been rescued, it's not by your works, it's the gift of God, it's the work and act of God, that's justification. And then, as you continue to read through the letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul then begins to go using that platform of, you've been saved, you've been saved, you've been saved, and says, now Christ has this for you, and he begins to lay out, you ready? The case for sanctification. And specifically, God wants us to be aware, not just for knowledge's sake, but because when you understand what it is that God is wanting to do and how he's doing it, then you can get on board. At the end of this week, would you like to be more like Jesus Christ than you are right now? Hey, at the end of this year, would you like to be more like Jesus Christ than you are right now? In three years, would you like to be? Okay, so if you know what it is that God is doing and what you're supposed to do in this, then it then it allows you to be a part of what it is that's going on. It, it, it allows you to, to jump in. Okay, um, my wife, um, almost every morning, now we, haven't, we don't do it as consistently as we used to, but my wife, almost every morning, gives to me something I call death juice. What it is, is apple cider vinegar, a half-squeezed lemon, cayenne pepper, ginger, um, cinnamon, um, I think some arsenic. I'm not really sure about that one, but it at least feels that way. And a little bit of honey, hardly worth mentioning. She makes us in some warm water, and then she tells, tells me I'm supposed to drink <laughs> this. How, how many of you have ever had apple cider vinegar before? When I said it, did, did the back corners of your tongue start to do that weird tingly thing? Okay, so I don't wake up in the morning and go, yes. death juice again today. I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. But my... Wife promises me that if I will drink this every day, I will live four days longer than what I would have otherwise lived. That's what she promises me. So all I'm saying is they better be a good four days. So my point is, when I know the reason why, then it allows me to be a part of it in a, in other words, I, I can, I can um, willingly invest in this. So I want, I want to show you what 
God is doing in this process of sanctification and how you can get on board with it so that what God wants to do in you will be done in you and will be ah, accelerated because you're you're walking the walk. You're walking as a child of light. Now, the reason why I can be confident about what I'm going to show you is because it's not my idea. It's God's. It's actually found in the previous chapter. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at three verses together because in these three verses, God lays out, Paul lays out by inspiration of the Spirit, Paul lays out, in essence, the process of sanctification. And it's a process that has three steps to it, and all three are important. Now, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to go ahead and confess to you that when I read through these, for at least a couple of the steps and many of the things that I'm going to say, you're going to sit here and you're going to go, duh. I mean, yes. We, yes. This is basics 101. This is so simple as to make me wonder why it is I gave up whatever I gave up on Tuesday night to come to the service. And, and, and I understand that. But there's a part of this process of sanctification that at least for a lot of my Christian life, I didn't get. And when God showed to me this part of it, I went, oh. Oh, that's how this, oh. And it was, it was one of those big moments for me. So I want to show it to you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 22, 23, and 24, because this is where we see the steps in the process of sanctification. In fact, each step has two words in it, basically, and it comes straight out of the text. You're going you're gonna to tell me, if you will, what those two words are when we read through them. Here we go. Verse number 22, first step, first part of sanctification. Well, real quickly, go, go back up to verse number 20. He says here, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Christ and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, and he's talking about this becoming like Christ, he says that ye put off concerning the form of conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay, so step number one is, it's right there. Let's try it again. Step number one is put off. So that you put off concerning the form of conversation the old man. Real quickly, conversation means Manner of living, lifestyle. So it's not conversation like talking. It's conversation as in living. So put off concerning the former conversation, the former manner of living, the old man which is corrupt, it's rotten, it's spoiled, it's no good, according to the deceitful lust. And verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse number 24 I want you to see. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So in verse number 24, you see a step where it says, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness. Okay, hey, who's righteousness? Okay, created in righteousness and true holiness. Who's the holy one? Well, it's Jesus Christ. So that this is a matter of putting on this new man, which is just like it is Jesus Christ. So, here, here's the deal. For much of my life, for much of my life, my concept of Christianity was this. And it makes, it makes sense. I understood and was grateful for the salvation that God gives and the justification, the declaration of my righteousness, the forgiveness, of, not my righteousness, but righteousness given to me, and the forgiveness of my sins. I'm grateful for that. And then I knew that my life was supposed to change. I mean, the things I used to do, I, I'm not supposed to do them anymore. And the places I used to go, I'm not supposed to go there anymore. And uh, the things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. Talk about the great change since I've been born again. So I knew that there was supposed to be a change. And so, from, from these verses, my brain goes, okay, so once I trust Christ, and I've learned about who Jesus Christ is, what needs to happen is I need to put off concern in the form of conversation. I need to stop 
doing the old man stuff. Stop doing the things that are connected to darkness, the corrupt, deceitful lust. And instead, start putting on the new man and becoming like Jesus Christ. I need to... I need to stop telling lies. I need to start telling the truth. I need to stop losing my temper. I need to start having a good spirit. I need to stop uh, stealing. I need to start doing things with my own hands and working. I need to stop being bad and start being good. Stop being like the devil. Start being like Jesus Christ. Problem. It's unsustainable. I can't, because while it is true that I have been forgiven of my sins and been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ and my spirit has been quickened and is now alive, I still have flesh that bends towards deceitful lusts. And I would go to a revival meeting and I would hear hard preaching about sin and how it's bad and doing right and how good it is. And I would think to myself, come on, Thompson, stop doing bad and start doing good. And if it was a good enough message, I would last for a week. But then I thought, found myself drawn back, not into uh, lewd, terrible, but still like Christ. Sorry, not, not even close. And a struggle that Romans 7 talks about, the thing that I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do, and I have this battle. That's where I was, that's where I was living. Until God showed me verse number 23. And in verse number 23 there was an aha moment for me that makes a significant change. Look at verse 23, where the Bible says, in the midst of, verse 22 is put off concerning the form of conversation. Verse 24 is put on the new man. And verse number 23, the Bible says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, let's start here. Um, give me some synonyms for the word renewed. What, what, what does renewed mean? Restored, that's a good one. Refreshed, fine. Refurbished, yep. Changed, make new. I'm a little disappointed that nobody's used my favorite one yet. Rejuvenate, still not my favorite. Still not my favorite. I'm highly disappointed. I'm highly disappointed. Revived, people. Come on, seriously. Now, actually, it's not my favorite, but it is a good one. My favorite is the word renovated. And if you look it up, I mean, if you look up that word specifically, it, it is actually a part of the defining or the explaining that renewed means to be, it's, it's renovated. Okay, so the Bible here says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, so that it's not just your mind, but the spirit of your mind. Not just what but want. Like, not just what I do, but what I want, want to do. Okay, so here's the question. I have a grammatical question. Ready for quizzes? Um, I have a grammatical question for you. When the Bible says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, is that um, active or passive? Just a second before you answer. Active means I do it. Passive means it's done to me. Listen to the verse again. The Bible says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So is that active or passive grammatically? Okay, how many of you vote active? How many vote passive? 
How many refuse to vote, just in case it's a trick question? Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about grammatically. I mean, in the grammar. Grammatically, it's passive. Now, oftentimes we think of it as active because it's given almost in a, in a command. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But in reality, it's not something that you do. It literally says, and be ye being renewed. And when you think about it, it's not something that you can do anyway. In other words, you can't, you can't, you can't change the spirit of your mind. Well, somebody says, can't a person change their mind? Well, well if you're talking about um, being convinced of something so that I used to think this and now I think this, yes. But when you're talking about the spirit of your mind, the, the mind is that center part of you, and it's, it's talking about literally changing what it is that you, what it is that you want, not just what you think. We, we can't do this about simple things. Um, how, how many of you, if given a choice, you get to choose one food for the rest of your life? Either steamed, no salt, no cheese broccoli, or else a well-seasoned, well-cooked steak or hamburger. How many of you are going to choose broccoli? Okay, there are, there are always a few. They make me nervous, but there are always a few. And then how many of you would choose a well-seasoned, nicely cooked steak or hamburger? Okay, so look, if, if I right now said, I'm not talking about what you should, I'm talking about what you want, like what you salivate for. Okay, so um, let me count to three, clap my hands, and after that, I want, I want you to change what you want. You ready? One, two, three. Okay, now... If you were to choose what you want, how many of you choose broccoli? How many of you choose hamburger or steak? Okay, if you're choosing what you want, why is that? Because you can't just, I'm changing what I want. It doesn't work. And certainly not when it comes to things that have value that are deeper than just physical taste buds. We're talking about in the spiritual realm. This, this is an act of God. This is the this is the power of this process. It is true that it is my responsibility and it is your responsibility to put off concerning the form of conversation. So there are things that I have to say no to that. And I am to put on some things that are right. So I'm supposed to say yes to certain things. But here's what is great about this process of sanctification is that in the midst of this, God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit, his plan and his design is to do a renovating work inside of me and the spirit of my mind so that I begin to actually desire the things that Jesus Christ would desire. Now, I can't say I want to be changed and want what Christ wants while still indulging in my flesh. I have to put off. And I can't say I want to be changed and want what Christ wants without putting on the new man. But as I am putting off, and as I am putting on, the Holy Spirit of God is actually inside of me, changing the very desires that I have so that I begin to want the things of Jesus Christ. Well, that's huge. Now, I will say that the Holy Spirit of God has a specific tool that he uses in order to renovate the way that I think. It's what, it's, 
It's what he uses to cause me to begin to want the things that are after Christ. And I'm curious if anybody happens to know what the tool is that the Holy Spirit of God uses in order to renovate the way that I think so that I will want the things of Jesus Christ. Does anybody have any idea what that might be? You guys are brilliant. I don't even know why I'm preaching it. Now, again, forgive the silliness. It's just, it's just to make a point. So, so that this is, this, is what, ah, this is what the Holy Spirit of God does, is that when, as, as I'm putting off and I'm reading his word, the Holy Spirit of God begins to change the insides of me so that I want the things that are right, and I'm putting on that. And what is happening in all of this is I, I then am continuing to walk down this path of becoming more and more like what I am as a justified person, which is righteous, and specifically it's the righteousness of Christ, so that I'm becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, somebody says, okay, Tim, but if I have been justified, and it's the plan of God for me to be sanctified, then why does it even matter that I know it at all? And again, I say to you, when you recognize what the plan of God is, then it opens up the door for you to jump, for you to, to invite and be a part of it. In other words, I no longer just read the Bible for the sake of uh, not having a guilty conscience for the rest of the day. I'm reading it so that the Holy Spirit of God can do the renovating work. And, you ready? When I feel a draw from my flesh, to go in a way that is corrupt, that's deceitful lust. And as I say, no, I, I, I know that's not right. I need to do this. Also at the same moment, I can breathe the prayer of, Holy Spirit, please cause my heart to be just like Jesus Christ. Please change me into the image of Christ. Please adjust my want or the spirit of my mind. And did you know that when we make requests that are already in the will of God, we know that he hears us, and when he hears us, we know we have the petitions for which we ask? Huh. So that I, I don't have to lose my temper. I don't. Now, my flesh still has that tendency. I know that for those of you who have children, your children never do anything that irritates you. But God has blessed me with children that on occasion are irritating. Let me tell you about one in particular. Just kidding. And sometimes the immediate reaction, the flesh, is ugh. But in that moment, God always makes a way to escape. And I can breathe the prayer, God, please change my heart. Please renovate. Please cause me to be like Jesus Christ. And that's what he does. Now, I'm out of time, or very close to it. But I want you to see two examples that Paul gives. Because in, he actually gives the rest of the chapter as examples. But he gives two examples in this passage that make us go, oh, this is a bigger deal than I thought it was. L look, look at what he says. Oh, I closed my Bible. Hopefully I put in a, yes, I did. Okay, so look at Ephesians 4. So he just gets through giving this process of sanctification. And he gives a couple examples. Let's start with verse number 25. Um, he says, Wherefore, since, since all of this is true, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Okay, so quickly, just to make sure we're, we're on the same page and it's making sense. What is it, according to verse number 25, I'm supposed to put off? Okay, are you ready? Let me give you a statement. You're going to be glad you came for this. Ready? Lying is bad. Aren't you glad you came to find that out? <laughs> yes, of course. All right, so what am I supposed to put on? Okay, so put away lying, speak every man truth, put on truth. Okay, what's the renovation? Now, this is, this is where this has impact, so please don't miss this part of it. What is the renovating work of the Spirit of God in me to make me like Jesus Christ? Well, somebody says, well, it's telling the truth. No, no, it's not. Truth is right, and Jesus Christ is the truth, and he told the truth. But look and see what the renovation, look and see what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in you. 
He says here, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we're members one of another. Okay, what's that about? What this is, is I'm supposed to care so much about you that there's no way I'm going to lie to you. Because if I love you, I won't lie to you. You, you cannot, you cannot, you will not lie to someone in love. Not ever. Lie and love d doesn't go together. Well, somebody says, Tim, can't you love a person so much that you're willing to lie on their behalf? No, you really can't. You really can't. When you lie on someone's behalf, you don't lie because you love them. You lie because you love you and you want them to like you. So it's always self-centered. So that my love for you is supposed to make it so that there's no way I'm going to lie to you. Of course not. Yes, I'm going to tell you the truth because I care about you. Do you see the subtle difference of moving from stop lying, start telling the truth. That's what Christians do. Well, actually, Start having the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ that loves people so much, there's no way you're going to lie to them. You're going to tell them the truth. Now, that's not something you can do, but that's something the Holy Spirit of God can do in you. Let me show you one more real quickly, and then our, our time is done. And this is, this is the one that, that um, is the gut punch for me. Look at verse number, let's go to verse number 28. The Bible says, Let him that stole... Steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Okay, so according to verse number 28, what am I supposed to put off? Stealing. And you ready? Stealing? Let me preach, please. It's bad. That's right. That's exactly right. St stealing, <laughs> stealing is bad. It's wrong. Okay, so what am I supposed to put on? Put away stealing, and I'm supposed to... Labor, work with my hands a thing which is good. Okay, stop real quickly. And let me tell you how I would have written this verse if God had me write it without inspiration, all right? Hey, don't steal to get the things that you want. Work to get the things that you want. Now let me ask you a question. Would our society be better if people didn't steal to get what they want but work to get what they want? Would our society be better? Would it be Christ-like? Huh. Because that's not what the verse says. The verse says, don't steal. That's bad. Labor. Work with your hands the thing which is good. Why? What's the renovation? What is the work of the Spirit that makes us be like Jesus Christ? So that you may have to... Okay, so let me ask you the gut punch question. Is that why you work? But do you work, labor with your hands, for the purpose of being able to give to other people? Or is it, I labor so that I'm provided for, and if I have extra or I can give, that's great. All I... I'm trying to, me, no, all that's being pointed out to us is this. I think there's still some renovation that needs to take place on the inside of us. Where we get to the place where our very desires, the spirit of our minds, have been changed to be like Christ, who did not come to, min to be ministered unto, but to minister, who gave up all pleasure. Is, is there benefit? Was there benefit to Jesus Christ by doing what he did on the cross? Well, somebody says, doesn't the Bible say that who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is now set at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, where was he before he came? So what benefit, what benefit? The point is, the heart and mind of Jesus Christ, 
and the work of the Holy Spirit in us. What he's working at and what I want to be on page with him about and asking him for and looking for and requesting and moving forward in is this. I want a heart like Christ's that so loves others that there's no way I'm going to lie. Of course I'm going to tell him the truth. And I'm not going to have uh, hurtful things come out of my mouth. I'm going to edify so that it ministers grace to the hearers. And I'm not going to steal. I'm going to work so that I can have the gift to people that need. That's Christ. And that's what God wants to bring us to. Now, if that were on your shoulders to make happen, that would be a weight. But this is what God is bringing us to. And this is what, as I put off and I put on, and I'm inviting and asking and allowing, this is what the Holy Spirit of God is renovating in me, that I would have a love for other people. And may God help us to have the heart of Christ. May he do in us what his design and his determined will is, that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I will be satisfied when I awake with his likeness. And that's where I want to be. Now, how about you? How about you? Is that what you need? Is that what you want? Don't, don't you think, whoo, don't you think a church full of Jesus Christ's sins would be impactful in a society? Because we so love others that that's, that's the way we think. Mm. God, help us, please. Do in us what it is that only you can do. We confess our inability. We know that you have told us to put off and to put on. and You've given us that responsibility. But, Father, the part of this that we cannot do and what must be done if we're ever going to be like your son is not just that we make ourselves start doing right, but if you actually renovate us so that we have the heart of Jesus Christ, Oh, Holy Spirit, please, let, let, let the love of God be shed abroad in our hearts. That which you have promised you would do, please do in us. We need this. We, um, uh, we in our flesh are not able, and, and we're looking to you now. We're looking to you to do in us what we cannot. I ask this, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, heads bowed and eyes closed. Just before pastor comes and closes the service, however he sees fit, before we're dismissed, I, I wonder how many would say by an uplifted hand, but Tim, God's dealt in my heart about seeing the need of his renovating work in me. And my desire, my decision is from this, from, from going forward, I want to see the scriptures as the tool that the Holy Spirit can re renovate my heart when I feel my flesh going towards something that's wrong, I, I know I have to put it off and there are things I should do, but I, wanna, I want to be aware of the work of the Holy Spirit in me to renovate and cause me to love other people to the degree um, that Christ did so that, of course, I'm going to do right by them. I, I need this, and I want tonight to be a turning point. I want to begin to ask the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do and to trust God to do what he says he will do in me and you'd say, Brother Tim, this is my desire, this is my decision, and by God's grace going forward, this is where I want to live. If, that, if that's your prayer tonight, would you just slip, slip up your hand where you are? Brother Tim, this is what I need, and I know it. Okay, all right. Then let's, let's take a minute, and let's just seal it with the Lord. Why, why don't you just talk to the Lord right where you are? Brittany's going to play in just a moment on the piano. As she does, you talk to the Lord about it. If you have questions about specifics, then please feel free to ask myself or ask Pastor and uh, get the help that you need. But in all um, truthfulness, this is a work of God in us. But it's one that he wants to and he will do when he's invited and allowed to do what he intends to do. Father, hear the prayers of your children, please, as they come before you now. In Christ's name. As Brittany plays, you do business with the Lord, won't you?
Well, I have to say that was a perfect exegesis of the passage. It's amazing. I think it uh, threw us off for a curve uh, that the put off, put on, and uh, the put away, but it would be that it'd be our strength. Anything in our strength is always flesh dependent. And so it has to be the spirit. And that was, that was, that was before I learned some great truth out of there as well. Father, thank you for the truth of the scriptures. Thank you for the awesomeness of the changing power that only you can do. Justification is of you. Sanctification is of you. Cooperation of us with the Holy Spirit to yield to these truths. And then glorification is of you too. And Father, thank you for that because we'd make a mess of those. But praise God for the truth of the scriptures and the work of the Holy Spirit to renovate us so that we can keep changing with the right outcome and the right purpose. So, Father, thank you for that truth. Now, bless and encourage us. May we have good fellowship. May we, may we uh, be careful what we learn tonight to go home and to write it down and, and, and put that principle in our mind and begin to live that out so that we are not frustrated with the beautiful gift yes. of sanctification as a dirty word, because it's not. Thank you now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, enjoy one another and get to know our visitors that are here and the ones that have come the last couple nights and enjoy a little bit of fellowship.